Universal Peace Federation, which was how to establish a, a, a culture of peace in the world. And Recording in progress. That is really needed, uh, given this outbreak of conflict and wars and the fractiousness in the world community of nations. So today we will have a number of wonderful presentations and chance also to dialogue. After each uh, major session, then we'll be breaking into small groups. I wanted to, to begin uh, particularly by showing a, a video. And I, I'll just wait for the technical, technical things to work out. Ah, now we see many hands. Make light work, right? So Universal Peace Federation started in 2005. Since then, it has really expanded quite dramatically. Uh, we're in most nations of the world, and we have general uh, status, consultative status with the Economic and Social Council of the UN. And to show something of our international work, I'd like to show a video. And is that going to, to come up? So this is uh, a video that came out two years ago in uh, the beginning of, of 2020 uh, for our World Summit. I, and it, but it shows the, the international work very concisely. Okay. Here we go. Thank you. UPF had its inaugural assembly on September 12, 2005 at the Lincoln Center in New York City. Reverend Sun Myung Moon delivered the keynote address. In closing, I ask you to devote your best efforts for the development and the success of the Universal Peace Federation. Thank you, thank you. After UPF was founded, there was a series of world tours where the message of UPF was taken literally to every corner of the world. That it is a time for all nations and religions to break down their barriers. Through this, the era of one family under God will arrive and last forever. UPF is God's cherished hope. The founders spoke repeatedly of an international peace highway connecting the world from Santiago, Chile to London, across the Bering Strait, what has come to be known as the Peace Road, and a vision for a renewed United Nations. UPF emerged on the foundation of decades of programs initiated by its founders and carried out in all parts of the world. Its growth and development over the past 15 years has been dramatic, if not miraculous, owing in large part to the work of tens of thousands of ambassadors for peace, peace activists, and volunteers who draw from all nationalities, religions, ethnicities, cultures, and traditions, bound together by a vision of peace, a vision of humanity as one global family under one God. The range of programs over the years has been both broad and expansive, from character education to strengthening the family, from conflict prevention to conflict resolution, from poverty reduction to environmental stewardship, from interfaith dialogue to youth service initiatives, from support of the United Nations to partnerships with the African Union and a wide range of international organizations and NGOs. UPF has a global, multinational, multi-faith network of more than 100,000 ambassadors for peace who support and contribute to the mission and works of UPF. 
UPF's highest award, the Leadership and Good Governance Award, has been given to distinguished leaders the world over. The World Summit Series is UPF's flagship program involving the highest level of leaders from around the globe, including current and former heads of state and government, to address the critical challenges facing humanity. Very appropriate that we are here on the 100th anniversary of Reverend Moon's birth, because out of the devastation of World War II and the Korean War, he and his bride found the courage to dream that they could achieve something. And it is amazing what they have created together. Programs have been successfully held in Korea, the USA, Senegal, South Africa, Nepal, Cambodia, and other nations. The most recent structural innovation within UPF has been the creation of a set of associations dedicated to collaboration among leaders from various fields. These pillar associations are the International Summit Council for Peace was initiated by UPF co-founder Dr. Hak Jahan Moon in 2019 on the occasion of World Summit 2019 in Seoul, Korea. ISCP is an international network of current and former heads of state and government. The International Association of First Ladies, IAFLP, a project of the ISCP, affirms and uplifts the unique role of First Ladies in contributing to peace and development. IAFLP brings together current and former First Ladies from throughout the world, drawing upon their experience and wisdom as women leaders and as role models who serve their countries in significant ways. The International Association of Parliamentarians for Peace, IAPP, is a worldwide association of parliamentarians which provides a forum to bring their experience and wisdom to bear in the search for solutions to our world's problems. UPF maintains that any successful strategy for peace must take into account the spiritual dimension of our human identity, experience, and interactions. Based on this worldview, UPF initiated the Interreligious Association for Peace and Development, IAPD. The International Media Association for Peace, IMAP, represents a worldwide professional network of journalists who support a socially responsible and moral media. IMAP recognizes the vital role that journalists play in providing objective reporting to foster an informed citizenship. The International Association of Academicians for Peace, IAAP, is a global interdisciplinary academic initiative aimed at contributing toward the realization of a world of lasting peace. IAAP is dedicated to building professional networks for academicians to foster a world of peace. The International Association for Peace and Economic Development, IAED, affirms the role of businesses, business leaders, and investors to make the world a better place. In early 2020, UPF convened a Rally of Hope featuring dignitaries including Pastor Paula White, Cambodia Head of State His Excellency Hun Sen, President Macky Sall of Senegal, former Canadian Prime Minister Stephen Harper, former U.S. Speaker of the House Newt Gingrich, former U.N. Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, and many others. I believe that the Universal Peace Federation and its broad set of partnerships in the realms of politics, religion, academia, media, economy, art, women and youth serve as a good mother. I believe the Universal Peace Federation to build lasting peace around the world 
and the heavenly unified Korea based on interdependence, mutual prosperity, and universal values. Celebrating 15 years, UPF will continue to grow through service, dialogue, and collaboration guided by its spiritual and moral vision of one family under God. I think in, in a 10 minute period, it, it gives a very good overview of uh, Universal Peace Federation's work and all the, that it's uh, striving to do in the different areas, these different as associations of work. And you could see the, the First Ladies for Peace and um, also the IAPP, the Parliamentarians of Peace. Actually, we have so many acronyms now with all, all these associations. But uh, Universal Peace Federation, it sense, is, is doing a lot of, of good work in many areas of the world. Some of its focus, particularly in Europe, we are doing a lot of work with the Balkans. So uh, that's been a major focus for, for our European, uh, European and Middle East uh, uh, UPF. So they've had a, a lot of partnerships with something called the Pokeritsa Club, which is a club of uh, former heads of state. Uh, and then these, uh, they meet from time to time and they discuss ways towards greater unity within the Balkans, which is, has been a, a real trouble area for much of the world. Um, I'm looking for Margaret, and I don't see her. Okay. Hello, Mrs. Carter. So, Universal Peace Federation, I think, has this uh, this goal of creating a culture of peace. So, one of our, our major um, components is creating world summits or forums where we can bring people from from different backgrounds together. Uh, Sheikh Ramsey, who I think you've seen many times. He's here campaigning uh, for the Rohingya. And you know, many times you know, we have meetings or demonstrations, etc., events that he, he holds. And I, sometimes I, I also did as well. And he went to a world summit and he was able to meet a number of people from the leadership in, in Myanmar. He uh, got to meet actually Aung San Suu Kyi when she was still, still in position. So we have that kind of ability to bring people from their left and from the right, and bring them together in a common forum where they can meet and discuss informally. That's one of our, our major components of this bringing people together from left wing, from right wing. Uh, so uh, we have something called a Think Tank 2022, which you may have seen in, in this video. But this also has co-chair uh, of it. One is the former UN Secretary General, Ban Ki-moon, and the other is the Prime Minister of Cambodia, uh, Prime Minister Hun Sen. Prime Minister Hun Sen is from, uh, comes from a communist background, is very close to China. Uh, Ban Ki-moon is the former Foreign Secretary of South Korea and coming from the opposite wing. So these two working together can bring many of the, the six parties that are involved with with Korea, the Korean Peninsula, and find the way towards peace in the Korean Peninsula together. So a number of our, our world summits recently have, have featured that, where we could bring these people from left and right together in the same, on the same panel, or the same, same room, so they can have informal uh, conversations. Thank you. <laughs> so I'd like to introduce uh, my Partner in peace. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> so Margaret and I have been working together a lot with the UK, and she's going to talk about 
uh, UK UPF. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Robin, for covering me. I was making tea for some reason <laughs> because I, I like helping uh, people coming from so far away. Thank you for coming from everywhere. Um, I just wanted to, to have a different look at UPF from my own perspective, from my own experience, and uh, not give you all the big details. But uh, I, this is why I, love you, why I love UPF. It's number one is very personal. There came a time in my life that I felt a void in my life. I had my lovely husband, two lovely kids, very small, and, and uh, house, car. Still I felt empty a little bit in my heart. So uh, around that time, uh, I actually was struggling in my heart and everywhere. I met a person who showed me a way through unification principles. And that person is here now, and I love her very much, but she doesn't always know it. <laughs> it's Patricia. And uh, having gone through this process, I understood that I need to have a spiritual life. I need to have something more strong. And, and my husband was no barrier. And um, from then on, I've loved UPF. But my favorite points of UPF is, UPF brings people together. Look at that. How many people do you think it brings in, at one time? Uh, it's because it's our principle of loving and knowing the other. Why we hate others or why we don't know others or why we why disregard others is because we don't know them. So that's why I think it's good. Can you go next? I don't know how to do it. I can do it by myself if you like. Uh, okay, like you said, they sit down talking to each other, exchanging things. Oh yeah, you do. You Muslims do this as well. Etc. You know, it, it's it's very important for me. This is what I love most about UPF. But my my number two uh, next, my number two uh, love for UPF is that it works in in for cooperation amongst religions beyond dialogue. This is uh, in, in House of uh, Parliament, and it, this is um, it, it was the international interreligious uh, council. Uh, inauguration, and imagine that in the House of Commons, or, or Lords it was actually, that we had a prayer. You know, it's one of the few that I know. <laughs> I've not been to, I've been to one very short prayer, but this was really uh, asking God to help us. I, I was so inspired. Next slide. Uh, in this in, in, interreligious thing, we are there, just something very simple, very profound. Every religious person of different religion pours water in the same river kind of thing, you know. We're, we're one, you know. And next, and this one is uh, very much international. UPF International President Thomas Walsh and the Vice President Taj Hamad were invited to meet the Pope. Why? because the Pope heard uh, through something that we were working on the, on the uh, at that time, it, it, I think it was the uh, Syrian event, and we were one of the first to bring two different parties together in a conference in Cyprus. I think it's that, but whatever it was, it is a great, great honor to, to be invited personally. It's just the two people, himself and the, uh, the other person that the, the, the pop nose. Can I have next, please? This is my next love. It, it, sometimes it's my first love. <laughs> it's for women, women and young people, young, young women. Uh, so this is, a, this is a thing that we do every year, elimination of violence against women, and every single year as well, I've done for many, many, many years, 12 maybe, uh, in Parliament, usually, uh, it's the uh, the uh, um, 
March the 8th, you know, Women's Day. So we, ha we also, in this one, you only see uh, Keith, but we had also other men. I also like to bring men to speak about, about women. So that's very good way to go. Next slide, please. Uh, some time ago, I was very keen on empowering women, you know, young women. These young women, we're trying to make them leaders, you know. They, they speak as if at one lot, and then next lot, the, the older people who are already empowered are speaking. Next, please. My amazing love is young people. Young people's training, understanding, loving each other, and doing things that are good for, for people. Every year, in July usually, but this time in November I did because we had a chance after COVID, uh, this, this was in uh, Parliament. There were 21 awardees for doing something good in their life. We actually ask people to nominate people and give us uh, their bio and what they've done. And then after, uh, after their, it was very, very, very amazing time. But then we, we thought, why not bring them together? That was actually Mike's idea. Uh, we, we, we brought them together last week, last Saturday, uh, here in Lancaster Gate, gave them afternoon tea, discussions, and they're working on projects. It's wonderful, isn't it, you know, to engage with them, to ask, to make them feel that they are wanted. And next, please. And this one is an old picture. Look, look how young we look, but I'm sleepy. Uh, this is, uh, this side are young people, that side are, are parliamentarians. Young people engaging with parliamentarians is, 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 um, is, is actually uh, something that we do every year. But we have not done it for three years because of COVID. But it's very good because people go there and ask questions and they feel part of, you know, important people, you know, to be answered the questions. We're doing one soon, I think. Next. <coughs> Ah, uh, this is my love. Family is the most important unit of society. When I, under I understood this, and when I understood one man for one woman, my, all my worries went away, you know? I, I felt I belong to this, to this group of people who love, you know, this, this family and, and, and the strength of the family. It is. By the way, we couldn't find a good picture. I took my, my family last, last Christmas. This is my great, uh, greater family because there are in-laws there. My children and my in-laws, my grandchildren. Yeah. And this is a very lovely photo I found. Uh, it, it shows joy, you know, being together with children. Next. Uh, oh, I've, I've, if I've gone away from uh, uh, the, the um, marriage, I think it's important for us to understand that marriage is really from God. It is, it is you know, not you're getting married. This is, this is something, it's a gift for you to build on it, you know. And that, that is uh, very strongly in my heart. Also, uh, in, in family, this is an international, uh, no, Europe, European event, where it says a conference about significance of marriage and family for peace. And you know, we, we even brought people from all over Europe uh, and we did that kind of thing. And we still do things like that. And we still also have a blessing that people want to join in, to come together as couples and give themselves and, and say to, to God, here we are, we're united for the family. Next. Yes, this is our family. <laughs> Next. Our family. You, you, you can, this is our uh, founder, Reverend Moon. Uh, when he was in England, uh, engaging with parliamentary, but, but on ambassadors for peace and receiving gifts. Thanks, next. This is our uh, mother moon, uh, our uh, uh, co-founder, Dr. Hak Chahan, in parliament. And she spoke in parliament, but her speech was given by her daughter. And these are lovely, lovely parliamentarians that supported us. Um, next. This is lovely image when uh, our, uh, it was our Father Moon's anniversary and we uh, celebrated here, some of you were here. It was fantastic. It, it gave us a, a real focus. Next. Yeah, this is the last thing. I just wanted to make, make us understand we are uh, part of the 
uh, you know, United Nations. But what is important uh, about our group is that we are one of 140 people in the world amongst thousands and thousands of energy NGOs that actually get the title, General Concentrative Status. And it's very, very precious. I, I hope uh, you enjoy your day today and, and uh, just a little opening for me. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. So uh, there have been many, many activities, and we would like to invite you to also participate or even initiate ideas for activities for the future. Uh, next, we have the, the honor of, of uh, David Fraser Harris giving our, our first presentation. David has had a long experience with, with interfaith. Um, particularly working with uh, in the Middle East. He lived in Damascus for 15 years? 14. 14. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so until it became uh, like re really difficult to live there, um, he was, he was uh, living in Damascus. His children speak Arab fluent Arabic, which is quite amazing. Mm. And also, he has uh, a lot of experience also um, living in Italy. He worked a lot with the Catholic Church at that time, and there's many, many precious experiences that he can draw on in, in, in his presentation. So please welcome uh, Dr. No, David Fraser Harris, who's the UPF Secretary General for Europe and the Middle East. Thank you, Robin. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Isn't it a nice day? Cold but blue sky. And thank you for those who've come a long way. Um, uh, this microphone is not impressed. It just fell down. Is it, if I speak too loud, will it fall down again? Thank you, Margaret. Very nice to hear from you. Thank you. Um, I can see faces who are already smiling. So you must have had some good experience with UPF already, yes. with those you've met or with the projects you've worked with. Um, and our function today is really to tell you the thinking behind it, the ideas behind it. Um, UPF is non-confessional, which means you don't have to believe something to be part of UPF. You don't have to follow this belief or that belief. Everybody has their own belief, and actually that's what makes it so good. We have people with different beliefs who cooperate together. But having said that, it's good to understand the thinking behind it so that we know where we're coming from. Uh, and so that is uh, our starting point. Uh, this is the first of four sessions, and this is going to look at uh, universal values as a foundation for peace. And this picture um, is what the water in the world would look like if you put it into one little ball. It's a picture from NASA. So it makes us think. Everything could change like that. We think of the water as 70% of the surface of the Earth but uh, we can damage or care for this world, and it's very fragile. If we move on, uh, we're going to look today at what we call the human factor. Universal Peace Federation wants to make peace between religions, between governments, between institutions, between families. But all of those are made up of people. And the real change has to start inside people. And that's why what we're looking at is three stages of the human factor. First of all, 
the integrity of individuals is key to everything that happens. They make the decisions in institutions and their character is shaped by experiences and influences. Let me put it another way. A lot of our society depends on trust, our banking system. Um, so many things depend on how much we can trust each other. And when that trust disappears, we don't know, we don't, uh, our society collapses. And the basis for trust, actually, is in the integrity of individuals. We have to start there. An institution is nothing if the person who manages it um, is not keeping the fundamental standard. And of course, we see that in the politics of our country. Um, people play political games with it, but it's still true um, that somebody wants to be fined but might be fined. Uh, you'll know who I'm referring to. Uh, that that's uh, our political system. We, we need to be in a position of be people of integrity. So what about the role of religion? What is the contribution that religion has to make? True religious practice seeks to restore peace. And what's the point of it? It's because it starts with you and me. I, in 1976, entered the United States of America carrying a copy in my rucksack of the Communist Party Manifesto in Italian. And I was convinced that uh, what would change the world was a better system. During the next few months, I came to a realization in my life, which is that what will change the world is if I change. And that's a fundamental religious awakening, that actually nothing is going to get better unless I change myself. And religion, in all its forms, teaches us certain qualities that will influence our families, our society, and our world. Humility in front of God, respect to parents, fidelity in marriage, loyalty, public service. All religions teach this. Personal discipline, sacrifice, control of physical desires, <coughs> restraint, patience, Forgiveness in relationships. Love other people as you love yourself. And in exceptional cases, religion even teaches us to love not just our neighbors, but even our enemies. To turn our enemy into a friend. This is the strength and the power of religion. And here's well, just one example taken from the Quran. Apologies if the translation is not accurate but I'm going to read this one here. Prayer restrains one from shameful and unjust deeds, and remembrance of God is the greatest thing in life, without doubt. I could go through a list of quotations from the different faiths. I will not do that today because we have limited time. What about the unification principle? It is explained in its in own introduction as a new expression of religious truth for our age. The truth is the same. God is the same. The fundamental truth is the same for all people and is never going to change. But in each age, the microphone falls down. Sorry. <laughs> I guess this is for the people online, so we need to have it in place. Um, uh, but actually, it's true. Something goes wrong in each age, and we need a new way of uh, understanding and connecting to God in a way that is living for you and me. So this is a new expression of religious truth for our age. What does it do? It helps to open the way for a harmonized view of religion and science, which is fundamental in a world which, in many cases, thinks you'll understand what I mean, that science has replaced religion and we've grown out of it. We don't need religion anymore. That's an illusion and we need to be able to show not one or the other, but the strength of both and how they can be harmonized. 
And the same is true if we look at the universal values that are present in all the faiths. Instead of competing, I always remember, um, these, these are words from Mar Gregorios, who used to be president of the World Council of Churches of the Syrian Orthodox Church in India. And he told me one time, he said, I remember going to my first interfaith meeting, and it was in India somewhere. And a person came up to me and he says, the problem with you Christians is we feel that you're like a spider just waiting to catch a fly. <laughs> now, this was the old style of interfaith work where people were there to secretly convince the other one that actually I'm right in the end. <laughs> We've gone beyond that, I think, in decades. But um, we need to see the great values in all faiths and learn from each other. But the principle also reveals God as a God of heart. Well, you just have to listen to Margaret and you know what I mean. <laughs> God is a God of heart and identifies clearly the importance of human responsibility. And this for me was fundamental when I first met with the unification principle to understand the role of human responsibility. Uh, it's not all destiny. And it provides an understanding for tackling real problems in the world and combines revelation and reason. What is revelation? You know the word reveal? Reveal, it's like you've got a secret and you want to give the secret to somebody, right? you, you uncover. Reveal means to uncover. So if God has a secret, who does he talk to? Do you give your secrets to anybody or do you share your secret with somebody you can trust? Do you understand what I mean? So actually, God is going to speak specially at any age in history, at different times in history, to somebody that he thinks will take seriously what God has to say. So there's revelation and reason combined. This is the words of our founder, Dr. Moon, Father Moon. Religion should be concerned with God's will for world salvation, more than with the salvation of the individual, or the welfare of their own denomination. As far as I know, God is not sectarian. He is not obsessed with minor details of doctrine. We should quickly liberate ourselves from blind attachment to doctrines and rituals, and instead focus on living communication with God. And a little bit more. In God's parental heart, in his great love, there is no discrimination based on color or nationality. There are no barriers between countries or cultural traditions, between East and West or North and South. Through interreligious dialogue and harmony, we should realize one ideal world of peace. And here we go. I said at the beginning, with the unification principle, we are not in UPF trying to tell people you have to believe this or that. We are bringing together all. So if your religion is not here, don't worry. <laughs> and if you are yourself not religious, don't worry. We want good people to work together for good. But we're explaining how we think about it. So we can look at the values that are common to the various great religions and philosophies. And at this point, I'm going to include a caveat. In this first presentation today, I'm talking about an original ideal or plan. And I'm going to stop at this point and tell a silly story with apologies to any doctors in the room. A man came to see a doctor and he said, I've got this strange growth under my shoulder. Can you tell me what it is? And the doctor said, I've never seen this before. I'll try and do some research and find out what it is. The next day, another man came to the same doctor and he said, Doctor, I've got this strange growth under my shoulder and I don't know what it is. And the doctor says, that's funny. 
I had somebody in here yesterday with that, but I really don't know what it is. The third day, another man came in to the same doctor, and he said, Doctor, I've got this strange growth under my shoulder, and I don't know what it is. And the doctor said, don't worry, it's normal. Everybody has it. <laughs> now, this is important because it shows the way we look at the world. We all know that a doctor knows what a healthy body is. So the doctor has a point of reference, what a healthy body is. So the doctor can compare what's wrong with what a healthy body is. Now, all of us want a good world. All of us want to change the world. But do we know what a healthy world is? Do we actually have the point of reference? That's the significance of this presentation, to look at what a healthy world should be. Um, and that's why it's an original ideal. And I'm going to say many things. You're going to say, that's not realistic. But is it what we want? And I'm freely referring to God and religious concepts because that's Father Moon's view and understanding. And I'm not implying judgment on people who think or choose to behave differently to the examples I give. So it's not meant as some kind of fire and brimstone judgment. I'm just giving our views. The nature of God we see as an internal and an external element. So inside the emotion, the intellect, the will, the concepts, the law that are behind all existence and ordering and giving direction to all existence, there is even more fundamental that to that, the heart. So what is heart? Heart is the impulse to experience joy through giving and receiving love. These are straight words from the unification principle. I'm not even explaining it. But if we think about it, that's where we're coming from. That's the deepest thing. It is the source of motivation for creating. It is the source of meaning. It is the core of human nature. The nature of God essentially is heart, substantially is emotion, intellect, will, concepts, and law, and then there is the external form of God, which consists of invisible energy. This invisible energy is like the energy behind all things of creation. And this energy if you like, it's pre-energy. And as it comes into existence, we see energy in creation bringing things together. So if we look at the elements within God and the, at the existences of beings in our universe, all things exist in relationship with each other. They are diverse and different existences. But the key thing is that these different parts need to be brought into relationship. What starts them, makes them aware to relate to each other, encourages unity to create something greater. This is the foundation for God's eternal existence. So this energy functions to stimulate relationship. On the level of a proton or an electron, on the level of a for society, on all levels in life, it is the same energy functioning to stimulate relationship. And the result is what we call give and take action. And this is the relationship when a subject and an object, an initiator and a responder, enter into relationship. Now, the universal prime energy, that's the invisible energy, which is God's external form, is the origin of all energies and forces that allow created beings to exist. The result is that those beings come into relationship with each other in the form of give and take action. And this give and take action, the relationships between beings, is what makes it possible for things to exist, to multiply, and to act. This is a fundamental law operating 
on, the le on every level of our universe. This give and take produces all value. And we can see, therefore, harmonious interaction ha happening between the subject and object, which actually produce love, beauty, and goodness. And in all of these, we see it's the relationship that matters. So here, God also needs an object to love. Let me stop for a moment. Love is a very nice idea, but it has no meaning if there's not somebody to love. Love has, is, has no meaning in isolation. And this is fundamental to the unification principle perspective that everything is functioning in relationship, including the creator God. So God gives his love to the human being that way, there is an object of God's heart, and that is you or me. And the response of human beings is beauty. And what is that beauty? That beauty, it produces a natural, warm, loving response to the love of God, and it is expressed in many, many forms, which we call filial piety, loyalty, faithfulness, trustworthiness, honesty, humility. What are these? Well, these are the good behaviors that all our religions teach, aren't they? And these things are the good ways that we respond to the love of God. Our world exists in complementary pairs. I think we're a couple of slides behind here. Here we are. Well, it speaks for itself. I don't need to describe the pictures. But actually, everything exists in relationship with something else. Um, and it is this dynamic of relationship that is fundamental to existence and fundamental to the unification principle. And if we look at the one element of that, that is the relationship between the internal and the external which exists as a fundamental nature of existence in every being. So for you and me, we have a body and a mind. And if you smile, thank you, it means I think you're probably happy. So <laughs> your body is showing me something about what's going on. If you're falling asleep, I don't see anybody yet, um, uh, that means that probably you're either tired or bored. <laughs> Um, so the body is going to express what's happening inside. Some people more, some people less. But actually, that means the mind needs the body to express it. The body needs the mind to guide it. So they need each other, right? And the same happens with an animal, which has an instinct, which tells it which way to go. I don't know about you, but I see the geese in Scotland. Amazing, the geese flying over. Um, although I worry more when we have bird flu around so much. But uh, the, the, the formations of the geese traveling and falling in the same direction. So there are many things that guide the animal world. In the plant world, we have what we call the plant mind and the body. And even on the level of mir mineral, there's a structure or an internal nature in every, every existence. Now, if that's true on every level, it's fundamentally true when we come to talk about human beings. The relationship between your mind and body, my mind and body, is, well, first of all, let's talk about integrity. What is integrity? Integer, right? Integer means the whole. So integrity means there's no difference between what I feel, I think, I speak, and I do. If I have integrity, there's no difference. Whereas a lot of the world, we hide behind masks, you know? It's so nice to see you. But you're thinking, who the hell is this? <laughs> right? There's, we have masks all the way in our society. But integrity means that we've thrown away the masks and we are real. 
We are the same, the same with you and with you, the same tomorrow and yesterday. A person of integrity acts because they do what their conscience is telling them is right. So uh, if we're going to build a peaceful, ideal world, let's move to the next slide, we need to become responsible individuals with integrity. And here are some examples, the kind of examples that we raise up in our different uh, traditions, different parts of the world. I don't even need to name them. You know who they are. These are great examples of people who loved others and lived with integrity, but also were responsible. So let's look at the next slide, which is the foundation for lasting peace and happiness. In this part of the principle, we speak about three foundations for lasting peace, and this is the first of three of them. And it is basically to build a person of integrity, which is the fundamental goal of every religion. But how do we do it? It starts with a relationship with God. And if you don't believe in God, you can say thinking of the higher purpose or living for the sake of others or a world of peace. But I think most people in this room believe in God. So I'm not going to worry about that too much. But uh, from that, in what way do our mind and body harmonize? As I said already, in mind-body unity with integrity, words match deeds. But also there's a growth in character, a maturity of heart, a spiritual sensitivity in such that we become the place where God is comfortable to be. St. Paul says, do you not know that you are God's temple and his spirit wants to dwell in you? That means to be a, a person of sensitivity to God and able to give and receive true, genuine, altruistic love. So this is a person who's got himself in order or herself in order. And we say mind and body, but actually we could also say spirit and body. Um, in other words, what about my eternal spiritual life and my current physical life? Have I harmonized them and brought them together? If we, if we are doing that, if we are living by the fundamental priorities of life, and my action reflects that, then we can be say we are becoming a person of integrity and we can be at peace in myself because we are following our conscience. A second pair system is the pair system that divides into male and female or man and woman on the human level, male and female on the animal level, stamen and pistol on the level of plants and positive and negative on the level of uh, electrical charges um, and, you know, even inside uh, the smaller levels of existence. Um, this leads to what we talk of as the second foundation for lasting peace and happiness. And this is looking at the division here between, uh, rather division, separation between husband and wife, or rather separation of the nature of the creator into the masculine and the feminine, that then have the potential to relate to each other, centering again on the higher purpose. Earlier I gave an example of Mar Gregorius talking about dialogue. And he said, you're like a spider waiting to catch a fly. What's the problem? The problem is that one person coming into a dialogue situation is not thinking of the higher purpose. They're thinking of my purpose. I'm here to promote my religion. I'm here to promote my nation. I'm here to promote my group, my faction, my political one. And therefore, that's so important that we stop thinking that actually I'm part of a bigger picture. And if I'm part of a bigger picture, the solution comes when we look at the created purpose given to us by God, which lets me fulfill my purpose 
in harmony with the purpose of the other. How can we do that? We start in the family. So if the, if, if the family exists so that everybody in my family is here for me, and I'm never going to do the dishes, <laughs> or, you know, whatever it is, if, if, if we think that everybody is here for me, nobody's going to like me. Nobody's going to want me. So actually, the level of existence in the family needs to be one where we think of the higher purpose and harmonize. Now, most of us are doing this. That's why we are building families. The family is the building block because that's the place where we learn to develop this kind of love. And it is through creating a family and raising children that we have the foundation to expand this to the wider level of family, society, nation, and world. So I'm now looking at the slide that says any being. All beings are interdependent. Most countries love to celebrate their independence, right? <laughs> Which is fair enough. We need to be independent. But actually, we need to be aware of our interdependence. And this is a fundamental element <coughs> of the unification principle. And I have to say, it is because it connects unification principle to oriental thinking as much as to Western thinking. Because Western thinking tends to look with the view of dichotomy. Is it this or this? One of them has to be right. You have to be A or B. If you're not A, you must be B. Whereas in the Orient, there's more a kind of thinking of what is the relationship between beings and how can they exist in harmony? So that's why the theology within unificationism, which exists, is uh, a relational theology because everything is created to exist through reciprocal relationships. And if this is true of the universe in which all beings have an internal character and a form and all beings have masculinity and femininity, then the creator is the source of all of that. So the nature of the creator God is actually those same elements that same dynamic relationship between internal and external and um, masculine and feminine. So this moves us to the importance of the pair system, which is a system bringing together different kinds of pairs, starting with the mind and the body in you and me. Well, what brings them together? If the mind and the body just exist separately, we're not going to have a fulfilled life. So what does it mean? We need to find the common purpose and exist for each other. If the mind and body do that, if the husband and wife do that, if the parent and child do that, and if the government and the people do that, we're starting to learn that actually it's the quality of the relationship of living for each other which is fundamental and fundamental to existence, and actually between us and our environment, again, all these relationships exist for our benefit, but they only function if we understand that we exist for each other. So where do we learn true love? I think from our parents first. They're our first teachers. And before they teach us right and wrong, they just give us love. They're just there for us. All right? So the family, we say, is the school of love. It nurtures the heart and the character and is the primary training ground for all relationships. So where do we learn true love? In relating to brothers and sisters, parents and grandparents, so it's also the school of morality. It teaches us the basis of societal norms and proper conduct in a wider world. Where do we learn true love? As husband and wife? Seeing God in my partner. Is it true? I think so. And you, you can actually hug the husband and wife hug. Okay? When you're in this 
Very good. Thank you very much. Give him a round of applause. Thank you. <laughs> good becomes God. The image of the creator. Living for the sake of each other, the family, and the wider world, and being a model of love to their children. Actually, that's what we try to do. But we try to do it, but actually, we don't often think of this. If the essential creator is essentially in the creator's nature, masculine and feminine, then it's only when we come together as man and woman that we are really reflecting God. So earlier I said, God wants to dwell in you. But actually, God wants to dwell in your couple, most of all, and be shining to the world through our couple. Families living for society, nation, and the world. Strong families have a focus higher than the self. Well, I lived for a long time in Italy. And there's an institution which doesn't do that. It says the family is everything that matters. I think you know the name. It's called the Mafia. I don't know if you saw, but in the news just a week ago, they finally caught the criminal from 30 years ago from Sicily, um, who had been killing judges and all kinds of things. But that's, an, what, why am I mentioning the mafia now? Because it's half the picture. Family is important, but not of itself, not against the world. The same way, nation is important, but not against the world. Do you understand? We need to think of the bigger picture always. And strong families focus, have a focus higher than on the self serving others, living for others, helping in the community, being part of a healthy community. So what do we learn in the family? Four great loves are experienced and learnt within the family. We grow up as a child. We experience God's love, parents' love, as brother and sister. You probably fought with yours. I don't know about me, you, but I did. <laughs> I used to fight with my brother. But I can tell you now, uh, I can trust him, even though we've gone very different paths in our lives. He's my brother, beyond everything. Uh, and I know many people in that situation who became like a brother to me and will always remain a brother, even when we disagree. Uh, because we learn something in these relationships. And we learn a spouse's love, of course, and then parents' love, the love of parents. <coughs> These are the words of our founder again. In the family, there are four levels. Grandfather and grandmother, father and mother, you and your spouse, and your sons and daughters. The world is an extension of these relationships. Thus, you need to love the people of the world whose ages are similar to the people in your family in the same way you love your family members. That's why I said just now, I have many other people like that when I talked about my brother. Because I thought of my brother, who I do a lot with, actually, even though we've gone many di very different paths in our lives. But then I thought of another brother I know, who I worked with very many years in Italy, and who's now doing something quite different from me, but he's my brother. Uh, uh, he's never gonna stop being my brother. Uh, so these relationships extend beyond the family into the way we live in society. And actually, it is the love and the relationships we learn in the family that give us the strength to be peacemakers in the world. Just as your family loves and unites, centered on the parents, so you should love and harmonize with all people according to the standard by which you love your own family members. In fact, God invested more to create his partners in love than for anything else. Likewise, you should love others even more than you love your own family members. And it's the saints in the world who we see doing that. 
the Mother Teresas or those kind of people, the people who we say, yes, they're loving the world more than they love their own family members. And that's what opens the way. The family with love at its core is the foundation upon which each, each of its members bonds with others, moves, and acts. A family is based on love. And I come back to what Margaret was saying at the beginning. You know, this is, she showed the lovely pictures of her family. Um, and she's demonstrating there, but also showing that that's what UPF tries to be, a family, where you feel at home, where you feel you can say what you think, and it'll have meaning and be respected. So living for others is promoted by all the faiths of the world. Luke, in the Bible. Whoever seeks to gain his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life will preserve it. From the Quran. Do not expect in giving any increase for yourself. from the Bhagavad Gita. <coughs> of sacrifices, the sacrifice performed by those who desire no reward is the nature of goodness. <coughs> and from the Adi Granth of the Sikh tradition. What is that love which is based on greed? When there is greed, the love is false. You know, I've got something I'd like to give you. But somehow you know that behind that give, there's a hook. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? That's false love. We have it everywhere in society. It, it comes on the internet all the time. You have just won a million dollars. Sure, this is a scam, right? Because it's false love. We are surrounded by false love. True love is the reverse, genuinely living for others. I'm now going to show you a picture of an event in 1992. Um, just as a matter of interest, was anybody in this room in that stadium on that day? <laughs> I think I was there. Um, this happened, as you can say, in 1992, and it is a glorious demonstration that the family is key to world peace. If you're bringing together 30,000 couples who say, we are going to make our families work because we want that to be our contribution to a peaceful world. Where can you start? You can start in yourself, but what are you going to do first? We can build a good family. If we have a good family, that's my contribution to peace, surely. So this is 30,000 couples saying that um, in the Seoul Olympic Stadium. Um, and of course, this is long before there was UPF. In those days, there was the Interreligious Federation for World Peace and the Federation for World Peace, both of which had conferences and both of which participated, that's why I was there, because I was at one of the conferences um, at that, on that occasion. Such an event, promoting and celebrating the family and the commitment of individuals to build good families, is celebrated by the world's faiths. So the people who give the prayer blessing come from the Buddhist, Sikh, Druze, Muslim, Native American, Hindu, and Christian on that occasion and other religions on other occasions. Um, and uh, they are delighted to promote the family. And we move towards the third foundation for lasting peace and happiness, which is, I've already said everything's about relationship, right? Even God doesn't want to be in isolation. God's happiness comes in relationship with you and me. God's fulfillment, the realization of God, is in the relationship with people. In the same way, we have a lasting peace foundation between our mind and body. We have a second lasting peace foundation in the family, a good relationship of love within the family. 
But then we have our environment. What is the relationship we have to the world around us? I showed you the water on the world at the beginning, and that shows you how uh, sensitive and fragile our world is. But this looks at the relationship we have with the created world and the world around us. Again, this has meaning if we center it upon the higher purpose or God's purpose. Everything is made with a purpose. If it's made with a purpose, we need to understand it and meet it, not just use it. So people say, oh, you should have dominion over the world because it's a Christian teaching. In what way? Dominion with steel? Dominion with trickery? Dominion, in what way do I want to rule the world? <laughs> Actually, it has to be with love, which means understanding, valuing, respecting, and giving to the other. And if that's the case with people, here it is in how we relate to our environment. So this means becoming true owners, owners who are really responsible, responsible stewardship, looking after the world. And if you look on the right, this is what it means to have dominion through love to care for the environment, to make it possible for there to be material prosperity for all people, and to let science and technology benefit human beings and the natural world. It's very simple. It's which purpose do we apply, I think. We go back to something like fire. Do you use it to heat your room or to burn something down? You know, everything we have, and that goes for nuclear energy or anything we're talking about, it depends what purpose we apply. Is it for others? Is it for humanity? So true ownership is responsible stewardship. With the beauty of the creation, we can be stimulated, excited, and we can become very creative. Um, and, uh, well, you can see, these are great examples. Um, I put a little one of my own daughter in this one. Um, it's about 20 years ago. It's a very old picture, but she really wanted to give some crisps to the pony. <laughs> <laughs> but you can see she's so excited, and she still loves animals, I can tell you. Uh, um, but... Uh, Anyway, this is relation to the world around us. So in the Bible, St. Paul says, the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. And basically it's saying that the world around us is suffering because we're no good. Right. It's saying the world is suffering because people are insensitive to the real value and purpose and meaning of the world around us. So we are not sons of God in the way that we should be. If we become reflectors of, expressions of the loving God as sons, as daughters, because we love in the way God loves, not because we're physical sons, because we love in the way God loves. If we learn that kind of love from God and we practice it, then even our environment will feel it. So we all want to be good. To be doing good, three things have to line up. Our motivation, our purpose, but also the direction we go in. In all things, we need to pursue beauty, truth, and goodness. Well, you know, I think if you came here, it's probably because you want to do that. <laughs> I'm sure it's part of your system and your nature. That's why you're giving time on a Saturday for a meeting like this. Uh, so that gives us something to build on. So I've spoken about three foundations. Foundations of individual peace, the relationship between our mind and body, and becoming a true person of integrity. I've spoken about peace in the family, which expands to peace in society. And that expands to the world. And then I've spoken about peace between us and the environment around us. And those three things. This is basically everything that UPF does is on here. 
all that we do is promoting one of these three. You know, if you come in the door, that this is also the headquarters of the Family Federation and the Women's Federation for World Peace. Uh, and each has its role in promoting these three areas of peace. The Family Federation has a major emphasis on the first one, on building true individuals. Uh, and then it also, of course, is involved in the family one. Universal Peace Federation is very much involved in the expansion to society and world. But these principles are underlying um, what we are trying to do, which is to realize peace through applying principle. These principles are found, among other texts, within the first book of the Bible, where God tells man to be fruitful, to multiply, and to have dominion over the earth. To be fruitful, to be a true person, to multiply, to multiply through family and humanity, and to have dominion to relate with, with the environment in a good way. So uh, I am going to end here, and thank you very much for your patience. I think uh, David is really passionate hmm? and uh, so, so sincere, uh, so you can feel that. So we now have 10 minutes in which we're going to break into small groups of about um, six or seven people each. What I would suggest, yeah, is, um, you know, the first four, turn around your, your chairs here and then the third... Third, to the third row, you can be one, one, little, one little group. And then one, one group at the back there, if you could just make a little circle. And then a group of the, the first two rows turn, face each other. The, uh, the second set of two rows face each other. And then a, a small group at the, the back. And if you feel like you're, you're too big, and you want to go, the, the group over there is a little bit smaller. So this is just 10 minutes, in which you can share together, and then we're going to break up for lunch.
Hello, everyone. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Thank you very much for your, your group discussions. So uh, shortly, we'll, we'll adjourn for lunch. I just have one slight change in the schedule. Due to a, a, a medical situation, I, I'm going to give one ambassador for peace presentation now rather than the end of the day. And I would like to welcome up Mohammed Ali Hussein Javid. Thank you. If you could come up. Uh, could I ask uh, Dr. Mike Balcom to come up and uh, Keith Best? Wow. Keith, could you join us as well? Thank you very much. Ali. Yeah. Ah, please, 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 of course. How are you? Ali? Good to see you, sir. It's good to see you. It's an honor. The, 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 the whole family is a member of the UPF. You're delighted to have him over here. Yes. His father is a member of the UPF. His brother is first, a member of the UPF. And he has joined us. He, I think he should just do, do it um, first, the family. Oh, that's lovely. Thank you very much. So we're making a, an award for this. It's OK. We're giving an ambassador peace award, um, partly because the, the family has been so uh, supportive of, of UPF. He himself has been such a, a great volunteer also in his personal life. And uh, we really were uh, so grateful for their support and uh, generosity and, and help for our events and other activities. And, for this reason, we want to present this award to, to Mr. Mohammed Ali the same Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is lovely. Just one second, please. The journalist wants to report on the news, not be part of it. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a spy on the outskirts, I'm not, I'm not in the arena. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I um, just say one other thing? Thank you. Thank you. Can I just say, um, Mr. Coker has been such a, a great support. He's such a proud ambassador for peace himself. I want to pray for his health. He's, he's um, got a medical situation which we really need to pray for. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Robin, uh, for your kind words. First of all, I'm extremely grateful that you have been giving the honor uh, to the whole family, as you know, they're all members of the UPF. I'm jolly pleased to recommend it to them because they are very dedicated and very sincere people doing a lot of work for the humanity at large. And alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, I'm jolly pleased to mention that I'm a part and parcel of UPF for many years, and it's an honor and privilege to work with them. It's an ongoing thing, and I go on wherever I go, whenever I get the chance, I spread the word for the UPF to bring more people for this particular organization because of their excellent work for the sake of humanity at large. Mm -hmm. As you have already heard the speaker, regardless to the color and creed and religion, that's the only way I was motivated and I was persuaded, particularly, I must mention, particularly due to the excellent conduct and behavior of these personalities standing in front of you. And today, I'm going a bit out of the way. I will request all of you to keep, put your hand together and give them a nice round of applause. <laughs> <laughs>
I don't want to take much of your time. Thank you so much. I was actually bitter under the weather, but I had to make an effort and to come over here. I could Thank have, so I, I could have not missed this opportunity. Margaret, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Keep him in your prayers, please. Mm. Uh, you know, um, we have um, we have an ambassador for peace that really wants to do uh, a raffle for um, for us uh, for um, young people, uh, and he has uh, she has very great, very good um, whatever prizes. One of them is three course lunch or dinner for four people, but there's some time to go. We have to give the time. We've got a 50 pound voucher from m and and we've also got um, one round of golf for four people, but midweek. And there are uh, two bottles of wine and something else. Yeah, anybody who brings wine here, we just <laughs> raffle it. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm sure that uh, there's some other things I've forgotten. I can't see it, but uh, anyway, the main point is to help young people. I, I know that the, the, the gifts are good. And there are, uh, there's a one, one ticket is for two pounds, but five tickets is for five pounds. Okay, thank you. So anybody who's, who wants can either come to me or whatever. So we we have lunch downstairs and there will be 12.30. Thank you for the rest of the session. For one thirty, sorry, <laughs> saving time here. <laughs> Thank you. For those online, uh, we're going to show some introductory videos to UPF uh, if they would like to see them. But uh, we will be back at one thirty.
This was a great turning point in history, the dawn of a new millennium. Which era's message should we be listening to? UPF, as an NGO in special consultative status with the UN's ECOSOC, participates in global level intergovernmental negotiations. UPF has chapters in more than 150 nations, and these chapters are working to create a peaceful world through various initiatives. The views of the founders, Reverend Sun Myung Moon and Dr. Hak Jahan Moon, in UPF's founding message, express their aim to overcome the limitations of the United Nations by ending conflicts around the globe and establishing sustainable peace. In January 2018, the African Summit 2018 was held in Dakar, Senegal. All 54 African nations participated. The theme was New Africa, Interdependence, Mutual Prosperity, and Universal Values. Representatives from all over the world are determined to work together to heal the painful history of Africa. Starting from the Cape of Good Hope in South Africa, they promise to work together on the Peace Road project that will connect the world. <laughs> Peace Road can be called a global peace project in which global citizens participate beyond borders of religion and race. Each year, the Global Peace Road journey involves 120 nations connecting people around the world. Last month, for the International Leadership Conference in the capital of South Korea, Seoul, Park Won Soon, Seoul's mayor, and about 300 foreign affairs specialists, security experts and leaders from all walks of life gather to discuss the vision for peace on the Korean Peninsula. In 2016, the International Associations of Parliamentarians for Peace was launched in the presence of members of the U.S. Congress and in many other areas of the world. A group of 20 leaders in 70 countries participated in the inauguration, opening the stage for the founding of the Interreligious Association for Peace and Development. These organizations facilitate cooperation between political and religious figures. World Summit 2019, held in Seoul, South Korea, is the foundation of a peaceful world without conflict. The Youth and Student for Peace is a network of young, responsible people dedicated to building a future world of lasting peace. The Universal Peace Federation and the Women Federation for World Peace Support, YSP. The Sunhawk Peace Prize is given biannually in recognition of individuals and organizations that have made enduring contributions to help resolve worldwide suffering, conflict, poverty and threats to the environment by promoting a comprehensive, future-oriented vision of peace. Peace is humanity's long-cherished hope. The dream of a peaceful, ideal world is about to begin. Peace is 
참사랑을 지배하는 시대가 열렸다는 말입니다. When our dreams can open new possibilities, may our steps forward build the ideal world sooner. In order to convey the vision of a peaceful world, until the day when we sense peace approaching, the Universal Peace Federation will never stop. We will keep marching forward. Today, the world is battling with a global pandemic and fears over long-term environmental damage. National lockdowns have seen an increase in isolation and a growing sense of hopelessness. To address this crisis, Dr. Hak Jahan Moon and the Universal Peace Federation initiated an ambitious online program called Rally of Hope, which provides an opportunity for current and former heads of state and government, leading politicians, religious leaders and Nobel laureates to present their vision for a peaceful and sustainable world. As the rallies have grown, so have their audiences across the globe. Building partnership across a wide range of sectors is imperative if we are to build a better world. I believe that the Universal Peace Federation and its broad set of partnerships serve as a good model. I'm honored to address you at this Global Rally of Hope, sponsored by the Universal Peace Federation, and join you in the great cause of building a more peaceful and prosperous world. During my four years as Vice President, at home and abroad, I've seen firsthand that strong families, education, equal treatment under the law, and a recognition of the dignity and worth of every human life is the foundation of true national greatness. With free people, strong nations, and bold leaders, there's no limit to what we can achieve. These rallies have created a foundation inviting international and interreligious collaboration in the achievement of peace among our nations. We can transcend the barriers we have created through religion, nationality, cultures, class, creed, and other differences that divide us. 35 years ago, the situation that confronted us in South Africa appeared to be hopeless. We were increasingly isolated without friends or allies in the world. However, we finally made it to our first fully inclusive elections on 27 April 1994 to the inauguration of President Mandela and to the adoption of a truly inclusive and democratic constitution. But above all, we have learned the importance of never losing hope. The upliftment of the common good over and above personal interest is a sure way to eliminating conflict and a pathway to attaining peaceful growth and development in Africa and the world. We must recognize that history shows that the rights and freedoms of ordinary people are critical to creating and sustaining our prosperity and peace over time. If there is any organization capable of convening a truly global network of people to genuinely shared efforts, then it is this one, the Universal Peace Federation. The issues being taken up in this rally are indeed critical to the challenges of our time and need to be accorded the highest priority. It is important for us to address them so that this collective effort will reinforce attention on these concerns. Let us promote a culture of peace and harmony around the world. Let us work to heal the broken trust that has fractured societies. Let us encourage facts and truth instead of hatred and bigotry. Let's also instill a sense of hope and future in our youth. Back in September 2010, it was for me as the then Prime Minister and for my compatriots 
such an unforgettable experience to host a delegation of the Universal Peace Federation and of the world-class Little Angel Children's Dance Troupe and Choir in Brussels. Your work is important, your work is crucial, your work is the pathway to a better future, a beacon of hope in these darkest times. We still have a very long way to go before every child in every part of the world has enough to eat. But the Republic of Korea story gives me hope for the future. WP started working in the country way back in 1964 in the aftermath of the Korean War and for 20 years we supported the Korean people with food assistance. And during this period, the country, the people, rebuilt itself from the ground up. In just one generation, the Republic of Korea went from aid recipient to aid donor. It was important to us that we were making a vaccine for the world and that it should be made widely available with no profit during the pandemic or at any time for vaccine used in low and middle income countries. AstraZeneca shared our vision. This vaccine was made for all of us to protect each other and ourselves. When I had the honor to receive on behalf of the European Union the Nobel Peace Prize in 2012 in Oslo, I had the occasion to underline the very close link between peace and also the values we have in a society. The society at all levels, starting with the family. It is our most basic community. There is one word that has great meaning to us all, and that is the word family. Family is the root of everything we are. Family is what binds us together, and family is the cornerstone of world peace. And all these faiths have one purpose. Hence, I sincerely hope that you will let all people know about our Creator and work to realize a world of peace wherein all people live in unity as one family of humankind, one great family under our Heavenly Parent. Please raise your voices and work together for this. I give you my blessing. What Mother Moon has done in carrying on the work of her husband in building a worldwide movement committed to the concept that we can find ways to talk with each other, we can find ways to work together, is the key to a successful future. And so I think you taking your time to be involved in this meeting is really important. More rallies of hope are planned in the coming months, featuring significant world leaders and luminaries. As viewer numbers continue to increase, this forum offers a great chance to inspire and connect people through its twin messages of hope and peace. Famine, climate change, and political conflicts mark the 20th century. Leaders, through their unwavering spirit, led us in the era of harmony and peace, introduced a new path through the darkness. This was a great turning point in history, the dawn of a new millennium. Which era's message should we be listening to? as an NGO in special consultative status with the UN's ECOSOC, participates in global level intergovernmental negotiations. UPF has chapters in more than 150 nations, and these chapters are working to create a peaceful world through various initiatives. The views of the founders, Reverend Sun Myung Moon and Dr. Hak Jahan Moon, in UPF's founding message, expressed their aim to overcome 
the limitations of the United Nations by ending conflicts around the globe and establishing sustainable peace. In January 2018, the African Summit 2018 was held in Dakar, Senegal. All 54 African nations participated. The theme was New Africa, Interdependence, Mutual Prosperity, and Universal Values. Representatives from all over the world are determined to work together to heal the painful history of Africa. Starting from the Cape of Good Hope in South Africa, they promise to work together on the Peace Road project that will connect the world. Peace Road can be called a global peace project in which global citizens participate beyond borders of religion and race. Each year, the Global Peace Road journey involves 120 nations connecting people around the world. Last month, for the International Leadership Conference in the capital of South Korea, Seoul, Park Won Soon, Seoul's mayor, and about 300 foreign affairs specialists, security experts and leaders from all walks of life gather to discuss the vision for peace on the Korean Peninsula. In 2016, the International Associations of Parliamentarians for Peace was launched in the presence of members of the U.S. Congress and in many other areas of the world. A group of 20 leaders in 70 countries participated in the inauguration, opening the stage for the founding of the Interreligious Association for Peace and Development. These organizations facilitate cooperation between political and religious figures. World Summit 2019, held in Seoul, South Korea, is the foundation of a peaceful world without conflict. The Youth and Student for Peace is a network of young, responsible people dedicated to building a future world of lasting peace. The Universal Peace Federation and the Women Federation for World Peace Support, YSP. The Sunhawk Peace Prize is given biannually in recognition of individuals and organizations that have made enduring contributions to help resolve worldwide suffering, conflict, poverty, and threats to the environment by promoting a comprehensive, future-oriented vision of peace. Peace is humanity's long-cherished hope. The dream of a peaceful, ideal world is about to begin. When our dreams can open new possibilities, may our steps forward build the ideal world sooner. In order to convey the vision of a peaceful world, until the day when we sense peace approaching, the Universal Peace Federation will never stop. We will keep marching forward. Today, the world is battling with a global pandemic and fears over long-term environmental damage. National lockdowns have seen an increase in isolation and a growing sense of hopelessness. To address this crisis, Dr. Hak Jahan Moon and the Universal Peace Federation initiated an ambitious online program called Rally of Hope, which provides an opportunity for current and former heads of state and government, leading politicians, religious leaders and Nobel laureates to present their vision for a peaceful and sustainable world. 
As the rallies have grown, so have their all across the globe. Building partnership across a wide range of sectors is imperative if we are to build a better world. I believe that the Universal Peace Federation and its a broad set of partnerships serve as a good model. I'm honored to address you at this Global Rally of Hope, sponsored by the Universal Peace Federation, and join you in the great cause of building a more peaceful and prosperous world. During my four years as Vice President, at home and abroad, I've seen firsthand the strong families, education, equal treatment under the law, and a recognition of the dignity and worth of every human life is the foundation of true national greatness. With free people, strong nations, and bold leaders, there's no limit to what we can achieve. These rallies have created a foundation inviting international and interreligious collaboration in the achievement of peace among our nations. We can transcend the barriers we have created through religion, nationality, cultures, class, creed, and other differences that divide us. 35 years ago, the situation that confronted us in South Africa appeared to be hopeless. We were increasingly isolated without friends or allies in the world. However, we finally made it to our first fully inclusive elections on 27 April 1994, to the inauguration of President Mandela, and to the adoption of a truly inclusive and democratic The upliftment of the common good over and above personal interests is a sure way to eliminating conflict and a pathway to attaining peaceful growth and development in Africa and the world. We must recognize the history shows that the rights and freedoms of ordinary people are critical to creating and sustaining our prosperity and peace over time. If there is any organization capable of convening a truly global network of people to genuinely shared efforts, then it is this one, the Universal Peace Federation. The issues being taken up in this rally are indeed critical to the challenges of our time and need to be accorded the highest priority. It is important for us to address them so that this collective effort will reinforce attention on these concerns. Let us promote a culture of peace and harmony around the world. Let us work to heal the broken trust that has fractured societies. Let us encourage facts and truth instead of hatred and bigotry. Let's also instill a sense of hope and future in our youth. Back in September 2010, it was, for me as the then Prime Minister, and for my compatriots, such an unforgettable experience to host a delegation of the Universal Peace Federation and of the world-class Little Angel Children's Dance Troupe and Choir in Brussels. Your work is important, your work is crucial, your work is the pathway to a better future, a beacon of hope in these darkest times. We still have a very long way to go before every child in every part of the world has enough to eat. But the Republic of Korea story gives me hope for the future. WP started working in the country way back in 1964 in the aftermath of the Korean War and for 20 years we supported the Korean people with food assistance. And during this period, the country, the people, rebuilt itself just one generation, the Republic of Korea went from aid recipient to aid donor. It was important to us that we were making a vaccine for the world and that it should be made widely available with no profit during the pandemic or at any time for vaccine used in low and middle income countries. 
AstraZeneca shared our vision. This vaccine was made for all of us to protect each other and ourselves. When I had the honor to receive on behalf of the European Union the Nobel Peace Prize in 2012 in Oslo, I had the occasion to underline the very close link between peace and also the values we have in a society. In a society at all levels, starting with the family, that is our most basic community. There is one word that has great meaning to us all, and that is the word family. Family is the root of everything we are. Today, the world is battling with a global pandemic and fears over long-term environmental damage. National lockdowns have seen an increase in isolation and a growing sense of hopelessness. To address this crisis, Dr. Hak Jahan Moon and the Universal Peace Federation initiated an ambitious online program called Rally of Hope, which provides an opportunity for current and former heads of state and government, leading politicians, religious leaders and Nobel laureates to present their vision for a peaceful and sustainable world. As the rallies have grown, so have their audiences, and they now link millions of people across the globe. Building partnership across a wide range of sectors is imperative if we are to build a better world. I believe that the Universal Peace Federation and its broad set of partnerships serve as a good model I'm honored to address you at this Global Rally of Hope, sponsored by the Universal Peace Federation, and join you in the great cause of building a more peaceful and prosperous world. During my four years as Vice President, at home and abroad, I've seen firsthand the strong families, education, equal treatment under the law, and a recognition of the dignity and worth of every human life is the foundation of true national greatness. With free people, strong nations, and bold leaders, there's no limit to what we can achieve. These rallies have created a foundation inviting international and interreligious collaboration in the achievement of peace among our nations. We through religion, nationality, cultures, class, creed, and other differences that divide us. 35 years ago, the situation that confronted us in South Africa appeared to be hopeless. We were increasingly isolated, without friends or allies in the world. However, we finally made it to our first fully inclusive elections on 27 April 1994 to the inauguration of President Mandela and to the adoption of a truly inclusive 
and democratic constitution. But above all, we have learned the importance of never losing hope. The upliftment of the common good over and above personal interests is a sure way to eliminating conflict and a pathway to attaining peaceful growth and development in Africa and the world. We must recognize the history shows that the rights and freedoms of ordinary people are critical to creating and sustaining our prosperity and peace over time. If there is any organization capable of convening a truly global network of people to genuinely shared efforts, then it is this one, the Universal Peace Federation. The issues being taken up in this rally are indeed critical to the challenges of our time and need to be accorded the highest priority. It is important for us to address them so that this collective effort will reinforce attention on these concerns. Let us promote a culture of peace and harmony around the world. Let us work to heal the broken trust that has fractured societies. Let us encourage facts and truth instead of hatred and bigotry. Let's also instill a sense of hope and future in our youth. Back in September 2010, it was, for me as the then Prime Minister, and for my compatriots, such an unforgettable experience to host a delegation of the Universal Peace Federation and of the world-class Little Angel Children's Dance Troupe and Choir in Brussels. Your work is important, your work is crucial, your work is the pathway to a better future, a beacon of hope in these darkest times. We still have a very long way to go before every child in every part of the world has enough to eat. But the Republic of Korea story gives me hope for the future. WP started working in the country way back in 1964 in the aftermath of the Korean War and for 20 years we supported the Korean people with food assistance. And during this period, the country, the people, rebuilt itself in just one generation, the Republic of Korea went from aid recipient to aid donor. It was important to us that we were making a vaccine for the world and that it should be made widely available with no profit during the pandemic or at any time for vaccine used in low and middle income countries. AstraZeneca shared our vision. This vaccine was made for all of us to protect each other and ourselves. When I had the honor to receive on behalf of the European Union the Nobel Peace Prize, in 2012 in Oslo, I had the occasion to underline the very close link between peace and also the values we have in a society. The society at all levels, starting with the family, that is our most basic community. There is one word that has great meaning to us all, and that is the word family. Family is the root of everything we are. Family is what binds us together, and family is the cornerstone of world peace. And all these faiths have one purpose. Hence, I sincerely hope that you will let all people know about our Creator and work to realize a world of peace wherein all people live in unity as one family of humankind, one great family under our heavenly parent. Please raise your voices and work together for this. I give you my blessing. What Mother Moon has done in carrying on the work of her husband in building a worldwide movement committed to the concept that we can find ways to talk with each other, we can find ways to work together is a key to a successful future. And so I think you taking your time to be involved in this meeting is really important. More rallies of hope are planned in the coming months through featuring significant world leaders and luminaries. As viewer numbers continue to increase, this forum offers a great chance to inspire and connect people through its twin messages of hope and peace.
Good afternoon, everybody. Before anything else, let me greet you in the name of God. Bismillah rahman rahim namaste. I think I need the help of God because I know many of you got up very early today and your day is already quite advanced and you've just had a good lunch and the room is quite warm. <laughs> All of which are good conditions for falling asleep. Now, one of my most embarrassing experiences as a presenter was in a room like this. And um, actually,